Well, after the seasons uh, 73, 74, 75, uh, trying everything uh, to, to uh, develop more power and to, uh, to be competitive in the sport, uh, as I say, uh, Lee Shaneth finally retired the team. He, he gave up, so then Bill was uh, frustrated and then free to, and he didn't know which way he was gonna go. One day he called up uh, Dave Herensberger. He called Dave to see if he would consider running two teams, and Atlas would sponsor one, pay and pack the other. He said, uh, Bill, how would you like to buy the team? And uh, that, I mean, Bill, he had never considered that. It, it, was, it was just unbelievable to him. And uh, he, he just, he said, uh, I'll call you back. And he called O.H. Frisbee and said, we have the greatest opportunity now to buy the, the pay and pack team. Herensberger just told me he would sell it. And O.H. Uh, couldn't believe it is, you know, is he serious? And how much money would it take? And it seems like it was $250,000. So Bill said, okay, what do you think? Uh, I can go uh, finance my home. Uh, uh, O.H. Frisbee said, okay, Atlas, will. Uh, we're gonna loan you the money and then you pay them back and you'll have this payment schedule and so you, you can buy the team. So Bill called Dave Herensberger and said, I'll buy it. Uh, and then we started the corporation, Bill Muncy Industries, and uh, Bill was a president, I was a vice president. After the 75 season, and, and I was taken a little bit by, by surprise over this whole deal with, because uh, 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 Dave Harrisburger and I, I felt, had a good relationship, and, and we'd, we'd had our, our measure of success, too. We'd won the prior three championships and a couple of gold cups and, and a fair number of races. And, uh, uh, we, and we were just in the process of, of completing what we felt was gonna be another dominant boat. And uh, then for him to, to get out of the sport really really took me by surprise. And, and we, um, we had some long discussions about it. And I know that uh, uh, I, I thought about it long and hard as to whether or not I wanted to continue racing. You know, even though I, you know, getting the opportunity to work with Bill, you know, that's, that's a real plus. Uh, uh, even though Bill and I hadn't necessarily been uh, all that close a, a, until that time. He'd been losing, um, he, the sport well, I think really wasn't healthy at that time, there weren't other rides, so for him to continue to race, he needed to, you know, find a, a way to win for his sponsor. I think first and foremost, he always thought of OH Frisbee and Atlas, and I think by buying that team, he did so not so much for himself, although partly for himself, but he knew he wanted to do well for his sponsor, so no, I think it was a great business move and I think most people would look at it that way. Bill went up to look and look at all the equipment and everything and uh, Dave took him to the shop and he had forgotten to say anything to Jim Lucero. And so Jim Lucero was very, very upset. The fact that the team had been sold without his knowledge and uh, Bill, of course, hoped that he would stay on uh, since he was uh, I mean, a very big factor in that team had designed and uh, built the, the boat. Um, so that took some doing on Bill's part. And unbeknownst to me, I guess the, the, the deal that Bill had made with Dave Harrisberger was that he would buy the, buy the boat contingent that I went with it. So we, we, uh, we had some long discussions about that too, both Dave and Bill and I. And uh, finally, I decided, well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll run a year for Bill, and, and then, I'll, then I'll move on. And uh, uh, I didn't realize, you know, when, when, when we were running with the Pantag, and we, and we had a lot of success, uh, and, you know, we, we had our moments where it was fun, and moments where, frankly, it wasn't all that much fun. It, it, was, it was pretty stressful. And I thought, boy, I, I just don't know if I want to continue going through this. Well, it was such a change to work with Bill Oh, because he, he made racing fun. I remember the first time we tested the boat, uh, it, was, it was all painted Atlas van lines, and, and uh, we dropped it in the water down at Stan Sears Pits and, and went out and ran the boat, and George Henley showed up for, for the first test. And Bill came in, and, and he wasn't seen very much. And we go up in the truck, and, and George came up in the truck, and he, he uh, told George, says, I am really mad at you. And George 
gets this quizzical look on his face. And well, why is that? He says, the last three years I've been beating my brains out trying to beat this bow. And I had no idea you had such a, such a Cadillac to drive. Yeah. And uh, he says, it was, it was just a great boat to drive. And, and uh, he, he you know, instantly took to it. Uh, and then once we got out on the circuit, and there was a lot of talk before the 76 season that, that Bill was washed up, you know, that he, that he couldn't win anymore. And we went to uh, Miami, and Lawrence Sawyer was, was working with me that year. And uh, we went out and we did okay in the preliminary heats. We qualified okay, and we're kind of thinking, well, geez, if we can get a second place out of this race, we'll, we'll be doing pretty well. And, and Bill pulled one of his infamous starts where, where he just snookered everybody else and, and, uh, and we ended up winning the race. And I remember after Bill came out of the first turn, he's got like a rooster tail lead on everybody. You now Lauren turns to me and says, I think we've got ourselves a boat driver here. <laughs> I says, no kidding. <laughs> so, uh, and that was, that, was, that was a great way to start the season. It really lightened everything up and, and uh, and, and that's where the fun really got going. The Detroit uh, Gold Cup in 1976, uh, the pressure was really on because other drivers had won Gold Cups in this Pan Pack Hall, and so he was determined to win that Gold Cup. I mean, he had to. It was Atlas Van Lines, and he was the, the driver. And um, So that was a very big disappointment to him because he blamed it on himself. Uh, the tail did fall off the boat, or the uh, stabilizer the wing fell off the boat, but he said he should have been able to, to win. Um, that he was too intimidated by that, the, the wing coming off and he should have pushed it harder. Okay, Bill, we saw the Miss Budweiser go over in a, an accident that really did a lot of damage to the boat, pretty well totaled it out. But you had a surprise in the Miss Atlas van lines when you pulled back into the pit area. And though we try to read each race course, that we go around the country as accurately as we can, where the good water is and where the bad water is, when you're getting, you know, when you get tied up in competition, there's just nothing like it. And you're trying to go as fast as you can, measure the limits of your machine as accurately as you can, and drive within those limits. But in the Detroit River, where the water is always just absolutely the most difficult of any race course in the country, we always have serious damage to boats and frequently to drivers. I came in after the Budweiser incident and we found out that we had lost our tail section, that it was destroying itself virtually, and that we had a big hole in the bottom of the boat. We only had 30 minutes before the restart. We didn't know what we were going to do, whether we could frankly get the technical inspector to approve the boat so that we were going to the final heat, repair it fast enough and safe enough so that I could even complete, you know, the, the, the balance of the race. So it was a frightening thing in our pit area where Jim Lacero, who became king, grabbed a couple of guys at Craftsman right out of the audience, stuffed them under our boat, and we all went to work to try and glue it all back together and make it seaworthy. I think they really did that. And of course, the wing has a tremendous effect on the aerodynamics of the boat. When, when we had to run without it, I think she ran pretty darn good. What are you trying to accomplish with a wing like that? Well, the idea is that you can change the angle of attack on the whole hull as far as its attachment to the water is concerned, or the way it rides. If you want to lift the bow up a little bit and maybe get or displace more air underneath the boat, you change the angle of the wing. If you're maybe in a little rougher water and you'd like the boat to run maybe a little more glued in or have more frictioned area, you can change the angle of the wing uh, in that interest. So it's a very flexible machine. How much do you actually feel in the boat? Do you have the illusion when you're coming through the turns, you're crashing high out of the water, the fans are getting a thrill, do you know actually that you are airborne at that point? Oh, yes. When it's riding in attitude, it's probably a, a, a symphony, a very understanding, warm, strong, almost a musical feeling to have everything performing beautifully uh, in good attitude. When it's out of attitude, you measure it very, very accurately, and I'm going to tell you, you measure it by the seat of your pants. If you've been measuring it a long time, of course, the guy who can measure it most accurately will do an awful lot of winning. 
And uh, as I say, when it gets out of attitude, you feel it, you see it, you understand it, and you hopefully make the right, you know, the right corrections for it. Yeah, the first race of that year, I got beat by Bill because uh, um, uh, he told me that he wasn't running well and I, I got suckered in. Uh, and he thought that was pretty funny after that race. Uh, we raced together a little bit more um, that year. I think uh, the accident that I had, though, in um, Detroit with the Olympia Beer is where that boat lost its capability to compete against Bill. Um, we really couldn't race side by side after that. I did drive a boat that he used to drive, though, in Madison, Indiana. It was a replacement for the Olympia Beer. And, uh, that was probably the worst handling boat I'd ever been in, and I thought to myself, how did Bill ever do that for a year or two? I just couldn't believe the talent that that man had in order to, to drive that boat. In 1976, the team won the national championship. It was just, it was so wonderful, uh, not only to own the boat, uh, but to win, to win again. It was just so exciting. He was so happy for, you know, Atlas Van Lines, and, and I remember there were uh, tears uh, uh, at a lot of the, uh, the winning uh, banquets that year just because he was so happy to be able to do this for Atlas Van Lines and, and all the people that had, had supported him during those um, uh, winless years. Mrs. Butterworth. Once again, she's helping sponsor our TV coverage of Seafair. If you're like me, you already know how good Mrs. Butterworth's original buttered syrup really is. And how it adds a thick, rich taste to pancakes and waffles and French toast and even ice cream. So Mrs. Butterworth, again, a, a thanks for participating in Seafair and a personal thanks for that extra thick taste of yours. Buying a race team was a big thing because, you know, it was a big responsibility, but O.H. Frisbee, who was his dear friend, was so uh, supportive of, of Bill. Um, you know, he really liked Bill personally. I, I'll never forget a, um, a story. I don't, I don't know if David told the story, but he had gotten washed down in Seattle on one of the uh, one of the heats, and he came back in. There was a hole in the right sponson, and uh, and the boat was kind of banged up. So he said told Seafeld, he said, go get the 200 mile an hour tape and let's tape this sucker up and go racing. You know? And so they're taping up and we're trying to get the water out of the honeycomb aluminum, you know, because it was soaked because the, it had been peeled back. And O.H. <clears throat> Frisbee was there and O.H. Uh, came under the boat and I was standing right there and Bill was there and David Seafeld and O.H. And O.H. says, Bill, this boat looks pretty bad. I, I don't think you should race it. And Bill says, oh, we'll tape it up and then we'll go out again. Are you kidding? Come on, put some, you know, he's telling the guy, he said, tape that up. and So O.H. Frisbee looks and he puts his arm around Bill and he looks at Seafelt and he says, David, would you take this boat out and run it 165 miles an hour? And David, you know, how close he was to Bill, he looked at Bill, looked at me, looked at O.H. Frisbee, he says, not in a million years. And O.H. Frisbee puts his arm around Bill and he says, Bill, it'll be another day for racing. You're not going racing in this boat. And Bill says, I can really go. He says, no, I'm not going to let you go. That was it. Uh, that was the type of, of friendship and admiration that like O.H. had with, with Bill. O.H. Frisbee was a real, real supporter of Bill Muncy. I mean, the two were meant for each other. Uh, they fed off each other's energy, and O.H. was very pleased and happy with what was going on and, and willing to, wanting to be part of Bill's life and, and uh, supported the racing program for a long time. And, and, um, and Bill really gave O.H. what he never had in racing. It was uh, almost, uh, almost like a son. The relationship Bill had with that company was beyond a sponsor, you know, client kind of a thing. I mean, I think he looked at O.H. Frisbee as a father, and I think O.H. Frisbee very much looked at Bill uh, as a son. They did a lot of things together away from the sport. They would always go fishing in Alaska together, 
And everybody in that company loved the guy. I mean, they really, and I was really privileged when I went to work, um, his secretary was made my secretary. And she, and who and I, we ended up growing to have a very close relationship that we maintain today. But um, it was a real privilege to kind of see his relationship with these people in this company, although secondhand to a degree, um, I got to see really how close he was.